Macclesfield or, or further afield, it's uh, wonderful to have you all with us. And this is the power of technology and some of the benefits of the pandemic, because we wouldn't have been doing this a couple of years ago. And we certainly yes. wouldn't be connecting with people um, in our own country, never mind uh, other parts of the, the UK and certainly Europe. So uh, you're almost welcome. Um, I'm Bernadette Bailey. I coordinate the Justice and Peace um, activities in Macclesfield, particularly centred around St Albans um, Church. Um, and I will try and uh, chair this evening, although in usual style, it doesn't need a lot of chairing when we've got a, a speaker. Um, and without further sort of, uh, sort of detail, I will hand over to Joe, who I'm sure will tell you, but is a member of our parish um, and is going to share with us this evening her experience of being a chaplain at Strange Ways. So it's over to you, Joe, and we're looking forward to hearing all about it. OK, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. Bernadette, Bernadette, before you start, I'm just going to mute everyone else. And then, Joe, yeah. you'll need to unmute. Oh, how do I do that now? Can you find you? Have you got your button? Are you ready? Unmute. Oh, right, that... I'm going to press the button of doom now. And then if you unmute yourself. <laughs> It's still muted, Joe, again. Perfect. I, yeah. Oh, right, because, I th well, I think I was unmuted before, right, but, okay. oh, it's first technical hitch, you know. Right, thank you, everybody. Um, you know, no pressure, you're from all over the world, I think, it's a global justice and peace, but um, thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for, for being here. Um, I'll, we, have, we don't have a great amount of time and I could talk forever about um, prison and prison chaplaincy, but I'm just going to start off by telling you a little bit about me. I've been a prison chaplain since um, 2005. Um, I read for a theology degree at um, Cambridge at the, and uh, lived in the Margaret Beaufort Institute um, Theology for Women. And um, that was quite quite an astonishing time and then I went I, I went to to work in a cat C um, well I have first of all I have four children and uh, several grandchildren seven grandchildren and you know um so I'm not just I mean a prison chaplain is what I do um and trying to balance that with with my life is is um is is quite sometimes quite tricky because you take stuff home but um so let me read my notes 2005, I began working in a Cat C prison in Suffolk. Um, I was living in Cambridge, and this this prison is where I honed my skills really, and um, and I'm very forever grateful to the people I met there. Um, one of my friends, one of my best and most dearest friends, has died um, a week and a half ago, and he was my spiritual director. Was um, the first chaplain I ever worked with and um, a dear man and I, I will you know um, forever be grateful for him because he gave me my um, he gave me skills and taught me a great deal about um, how prison um, it, prison is a place where there are rules and there are regulations and they're to keep everybody safe but sometimes you have to push against them um I work then I went to a prison called Whitemore which is a dispersal which means that there it's a, it's in the Cate in the high security estate and um in the middle of Cambridgeshire in March a place called March and that is um a place that houses men that some of those men will never leave prison and um I spent six years in that prison and um, that I work in a multi-faith team that was the um the, I worked in a multi-faith team in the Cat C but Whitemore was the first place that I worked in a multi-faith team where we had to be absolutely um cohesive because we have at Whitemore there are an awful lot of um terrorist and extremist prisoners and so as a Catholic chaplain, um, there were some extremists, but I worked with this multi-faith team and we had to be 
uh, absolutely have each other's backs. Um, I then went to work for a prison charity called PACT for two years as their chaplain. And then I worked as a community chaplain where I um, learnt what it's like to be released in this country, in the UK. And out of the 90 men that um, I put volunteers around and I supported, uh, three of those men were housed. It was a very sorry state of affairs in our, in our country. And one of those men spent a year going round and round and round on the night bus in London. And um, his tariff was for the next three years and he was not meant to go. One of, the, one of his um, conditions was that he had a roof over his head. So um, I learned a great deal about um, what it's like to be released, how scary it is for our men and for our women. I supported one woman in that time as well. And that was, um, that was another uh, interesting um, insight because sometimes when women are um, released, they are very vulnerable. And this woman was particularly vulnerable. Um, I worked out of Brixton and Pentonville, two very old prisons. Um, London is particularly bad, but Manchester, Manchester isn't great either. We have a lot of homeless men who have been released, but Manchester does at least have a very good community chaplaincy. So um, I went from there, I decided um, I didn't know what to do. I, I, just, I didn't know whether to go back to um, the community chaplaincy, whether to do something else or whether to carry on um, looking for a role in prison. And in the end, um, something um, presented itself and it was HMP Manchester. So I um, applied for that post because I had been out, it wasn't an internal um, position. So I applied for that and I, um, I was uh, appointed as Roman Catholic chaplain at HMP Manchester uh, three and a half years ago. Uh, moved from Cambridgeshire back to Manchester. So HMP Manchester is um, 150 years old. It has housed a great deal of um, very interesting um, people from um, my, our office is directly opposite the old gate and through the, that gate have, have come suffragettes and people who have been executed in that prison. Uh, the last execution in Manchester, in, in Britain was in um, HMP Manchester, not, not really a statistic that, that we enjoy, but um, it has a very rich and varied history. I work in a multi-faith team. Um, again, we have to have each other's backs. Um, and um, I'm just looking at my notes, which are not, sorry, I'm going to be a bit stilted here. So HMP Manchester has at the moment re-rolled. We are not um, a local prison anymore or a remand prison. Forest Bank in Manchester is a remand prison. We are a um, Cat B trainer and at the moment, we have 635 men. That's gone down from around 900 um, to 635. Many of those men cannot share cells. So we, um, we, we've got quite a, a low number. Sadly, 190 of those men are Roman Catholic, and that's the highest proportion, more than Muslim, more than Anglican, who are around 90. Um, we have two pagans, we have uh, two Jewish prisoners, but the majority are Roman Catholic. And uh, a lot of my work is generic, so I don't just see Roman Catholic men, but I, um, I do know a great deal of them. And um, looking at my notes again, um, what I thought I might do is, I wondered whether to give a day in the life of a prison chaplain but I also wanted to talk a little bit about this book, A Place of Redemption, which was um, put together by the Catholic Bishops Conference. And um, if I 
if I can ask you to read one book about prison, it's this book. It talks about um, how there are times that we need to imprison people. There are men that I know who, who know themselves they cannot live near uh, the people that we love. They cannot, they, they know that they're, they are um, in danger of hurting someone else. So they prefer to be in prison. And then there are men that we incarcerate and women that should actually be out on, um, on license, on, on, on a tag. We imprison far too many people in our, um, in our criminal justice system in Britain. And um, this book discusses it far better than I'm going to discuss it. Um, this book talks about mercy. It talks about how we see people in prison. Is it punishment or is it um, restoration? I don't like the word rehabilitation. I like the word restoration. And are we about restoring people? Jesus said when we visit um, someone in prison, we're visiting him. And this book does unpick it. So I would, um, I'll send the link to um, David and I think it's a really good book to, to have. And um, it, Isaiah, talk, is it Isaiah talks about liberating captives. Um, the business of liberating captives can be as much about how we treat those who are in prison as well about considering whether certain offenders should be behind bars at all. So um, liberating captives in a, in, a, in, a, in a very small way is about um, chaplaincy almost. It's about helping people to be set free from the things that um, have brought them back to prison over and over again. In, um, in our prison, some of those, um, some of those behaviours have brought people over and over until um, the point where there is no option but to incarcerate them for a very long time. Some of the people I work with have um, done, um, have, have actually only committed one crime and it will be life sometimes. Um, and that's, that's hard. One of, one of the um, tasks that we have is to help people to live a very full and rich life inside. And we do that alongside education, alongside psychology. Uh, we work in a very multidisciplinary way. Years ago, uh, in 2013, I was asked to preach in King's College Chapel, Cambridge. And I asked the men that I worked with at that point, was there anything they wanted me to include in that sermon? And I just want to say, I just want to say a couple of those things because they gave me permission. B says that in the 22 years he has spent in prison, many of those in therapy, he has dealt with the pain of the night he and his friend got into a fight and he killed him. He will never forgive himself, he says, but he has learned over the past 22 years that God has forgiven him. B took someone else's life and he cannot bring him back. He is not the same man, and yet he cannot choose many things for himself. He is locked up when he is told to be, he eats when he is told to eat, he showers when he is told he can, and so on. He will pay for taking his friend's life for many more, more years. There's a word that is little used in prison. But my Christian colleagues and I use it a lot. We love the men we serve. A prison is rightly suspicious of people who wander around telling prisoners that they love them. And actually that's not really how it's done. There are many moments when the listening and the empathy combine to create the deepest experience of being the body of Christ to each other. And to be that behind the walls and the wire of a high security prison is remarkable. It is healing and we choose to love. One of the things I mentioned at that point was um, about staff. 
staff have a very difficult job, um, officers and chaplains. And one of the tasks of a chaplain is to care for staff. Often there are very traumatic um, incidents. Um, the, our prisons are not lovely places and the high security estate can feel brutal on the senses with its walls, fences, searches and dogs. There are staff who feel that tension that, that tension that comes from outside, that doesn't recognise the hard work they do. There are prisoners who read papers describing them as less than human. Hidden people, all of them, and vulnerable to the inaccuracies of the media. People who feel powerless and at the mercy of government and policy makers, who make changes that do not issue from their own experience. But despite the difficulties and tensions, there are acts of goodness and people who care deeply. And it is our, it is my privilege to see that it is kindness and it is love that helps people to grow. So I shall put that aside now because um, I, could, I could give you a day in the life of a prison chaplain and I shall do that in a second over about two minutes, but what I want to actually um, convey is the idea that um, prisons are often very unjust places. And, but there is often, there's this huge, um, there is also this huge goodness in there. And chaplains, have the task of untapping, of, of, of tapping into where that goodness is, whether it's staff, whether it's prisoners. And it's about saying, your life isn't over. And that's a real challenge to a chaplain as well, because our lives aren't perfect. Our lives are um, fractured. We have pain, we have grief. We are sinners. And yet we go in there and we bring a message that, um, that, that Jesus is about liberating the captives. Um, my, it's not just Christians, actually. My Muslim colleagues have that message, too, that, that um, you can be free inside. So that's, that's, that's what I want to convey. So... Um, the idea that, that prison chaplaincy is about going in and doing to the things for people isn't, it, is, it does happen like that because people are locked down and during COVID they've been locked down. We had 150 um, COVID cases at one point over two weeks in our prison and that was terrible and we're still over two weeks, um, two years, still locked down 22 hours a day. It's not about doing things, it's about looking at where we can help people to do stuff for themselves. We have um, services at the moment, we're not back to mass, we have services um, that are ecumenical at the moment. We, um, we put together something which, um, which can serve both um, Protestant men and Catholic men. And that's working at the moment, but it's not ideal. Um, but we don't do things. We enable people to, to, to do stuff for themselves. The places where we have to do things are places where there are uh, family issues. So chaplains are all about connecting family and helping family to, um, to stay in touch because fam because relationships break down in prison and um, we, um, we take a lot of phone calls from families. One of our tasks is to um, notify prisoners when someone has died in the family and that's never pleasant. We, um, at the moment, we are conducting funerals on iPads uh, because prisoners can't always go out to um, to funerals, they only go to the, the, the funeral of their family member. So one of our tasks in a day might be taking um, a phone call, that's quite hard. Um, a day in the life of a chaplain is 
checking, getting in, checking messages, checking emails, um, looking at where there have been um, self-harm incidents overnight, visiting people who have self-harmed, attending meetings called ACTS, which is a through care document enabling. We work very closely with psychology and mental health and uh, uniform staff. So attending those meetings where someone has done that, um, we might get a phone call that tells somebody, tells us somebody's died. So we have to go and break that news. Then we'll, um, we will um, bring people together to support that prisoner. Sometimes if there's been a drug addiction, we'll bring in uh, DARS, who are the drugs um, referral service in our prison. We um, attend meetings um, such as Pathfinders, which is about um, terrorist and extremist prisoners and um, working out where chaplaincy fits in with that because often it does because it's often religious and um, political but religious um, and then we will um, we will um, refer people we have something called safer custody so we work in conjunction with them and we'll go and see safer custody and work out where um, where we can help someone someone might just need something like pens and paper to work um, or to write write stuff down um, and so we'll go to say for custody and they will um, go and see them or we might refer and take pens and paper we might refer somebody um, who is struggling with um, with uh, a disability and they're on the wrong someone has held them on the wrong we have um, our wings have four it's very old prison. We have um, four uh, landings, so we might go and say, "Well, um, someone is on um, on on the second landing and they can't make those stairs." And so, for custody, we'll meet them. A chaplain is not just about kind of bringing um, a religious aspect to that role. We we are involved in almost every aspect of of prisoners' lives. Sometimes um, their phones. Um, their phone numbers might have disappeared and um, so we will contact family we will contact their the the business hub and try and get those numbers put back on we attend meetings um where we put input into where um the, the care of prisoners so there'll be a multidisciplinary um, meeting about prisoners who are very mentally unwell and we will attend those meetings as well. Um, I'm trying to get this all in in a, uh, in a nutshell really about who we are, why we're there um, and what we do. Um, this day in the life involves um, all those issues. I, I could take you through, but every day is different, but all those issues in some way will happen in a day. And um, we um, we are privileged to be there at, um, in the most difficult places for some some prisoners. Um, one of the things that's happening at the moment is that um, there is not a great deal of association um, time for prisoners. So we um, when we go and see them, sometimes we have to see them at their cell. So I have, if you can imagine, a door, and it's not very decent, but a door, and there will be a a, a crack in that door we often stand there and we are listening to someone's story and it's not great and we will pray through we sometimes they'll say they'll, the guys will ask us to to pray with them so we'll pray through that crack in the door and some of those moments are the most um the most meaningful moments in and very humbling um I'm just trying, something just fl flitted through my brain. I made a note about it. Um, it was, um, I have attended deaths in custody where people have taken their own lives, lives and um, that's quite shocking. Um, very traumatizing for staff and uh, for the other prisoners on the wing. So we try and keep a level, um, a level attitude. We'll go and visit people and go and visit on the wing and make sure that that, um, that, that the guys are okay. Um,
they can go on something called the Unilink. So the guys will put in um, a question for chaplain, can you, the chaplain say, can you come and see me? Or can I attend the service? Or, um, you know, my, I haven't heard from my daughter for, for four weeks, could a chaplain come and see me? Um, those things come through. And so we check those every day and make sure there's 24 hour response rate. Um, I think what I might do is, because I've talked for about, I don't know how long it is, I can't see. Um, I think it's about, is it about um, 25 minutes? Um, I made my notes, but I'm not very good at looking. I've looked at them, but I've kept, I've, I've departed a lot. If there's anything that anyone wants to ask me, I can try and answer that question. And um, also, one of the things that I wanted to say um, during this is that we are always looking for volunteers. The Anglicans in our prison have um, plenty of volunteers. Catholic, Catholic volunteers are very thin on the ground and um, we don't have one. Oh yeah, we do. We do have one Catholic volunteer. Um, no, two actually, but one, one comes in every Sunday for services. And one of them we have is a brother from a community and he's been coming in for about 25 years and he is amazing. And his community um, take care of the, some of the families the, of the men that we, that we serve outside. So that's pretty amazing. Um, I'm gonna unmute so that if anyone wants to ask me a question um, that would be really helpful and then I can Stop waffling. Okay. Okay, Joe. Thank you very much for in giving us such great insight in such a small small amount of time. <laughs> yeah. So you are now muted, Joe. So you probably want to unmute so you can respond to anybody's questions. If that's okay. Yep, that's perfect. So do, do, do people want to either use your own hand or to use the hand on Zoom, whichever you wish to? And I can see uh, Jerome has got his hand up straight away, I think, waving at me. So uh, over to you. So when you when you wish to answer, ask a question, just unmute yourself and then uh, ask Joe directly. Hi, Joe. <clears throat> Excuse me. That, that was absolutely fascinating. And... <laughs> Very, very emotional as well. I mean, I've, I, I've, I could feel an emotion coming from you, and I was certainly feeling it in what you were saying. I have two questions, really, um, and I'm going to say them both, and then you can answer them both. The first is, are you there exclusively for the prisoners, or do you actually feel or, or do you actually find that your, your ministry is also for um the the actual warders in the prison i'm sure there's a better term for them than warders but that's the officers. one that's to my mind yeah, we call them officers the office, prison officers yes i should know that because one of my one of my nephews is a or was a prison officer i think at strange ways um a, a good while ago i don't know if he still is the second question is um you got you're a woman you're going into a place where a lot of people but where it's all male, I'm guessing that a lot of people are in for violent crimes um, and they're, they're held very securely. Do you feel threatened and how do you combat that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jerome. First of all, there we uh, chaplains are there for all the staff. One of the legal requirements, you cannot open a prison without a governor, a doctor and a, and a chaplain. That's a, a very old um, legal requirement. We are there for staff as well. We have, we're there for staff, but we also have a care team. And um, I'm not on the care team in this prison, but I was in my previous prison. Um, so staff, uh, when there's a trauma, um, I'm not on the care team, but I will always go and see staff and um you know check that they're okay um staff are a very rare breed they um prison staff 
they will often um, say that they're okay, but there is an off, there is an underlying trauma. But they're very good at um, kind of hiding that sometimes, which is quite quite tricky. But but we are there for everybody, and um, I count. I've got prison officers that I count as very good friends now from other prisoners, other prisons, and and from from HMP Manchester as well. Um, a forgotten service, and we as chaplains try and remember that, um, because you know you everybody else is remembered, but prison staff are behind walls, and and they tend to be forgotten. So yeah, we're there for everybody. Second question is interesting. Yeah. Um, well, I've been a prison chaplain for 16 years and I have only once, I think, felt um, felt slightly vulnerable. Um, but I have sat with, um, if there is somebody that cannot see a woman on their own, then that's flagged up on their notes and we will check that. And then we'll, we'll, see, we'll see them with a member of staff. But it's very rare, really. And, you know, I walk on wings and my, me and my, my colleagues, I've got one other female colleague there. We walk on wings. We just walk. We just talk to people in general. Um, prisoners are very, very respectful and they know that we're there for them. We're there to care for them. And it's very rare that anybody is rude. And if they're rude or they are aggressive, it's usually when there's um a, a very difficult mental health issue present. Um, I, I don't feel vulnerable in a prison. I'm more vulnerable leaving the prison. I left, um, I left Manchester the other day. I walked up the road and two, two young men were walking towards me and one have had a blade out. And I just thought, I'm just gonna carry on walking here because he doesn't want me. So I just carried on walking. And um, I think I feel more vulnerable outside of the prison now. Um, that's not to say I'm comfortable, but it is to say that um, that what a prisoner once said to me um, many years ago um, when I was in in um, in a dispersal, Miss, because um, I said to him, I'm really sorry, um, you know, that something had happened. And I said, I said it's going to stay this way, um, and I'm sorry that you're you're annoyed about this. And he said to me, Miss. Um, it doesn't change the fact that if you walked on the wing and someone um, someone made an attempt to um, to hurt you, we would all we would all protect you. And I think that's a very um, that's a very um, that that does happen. I've had prisoners say to me, "Miss, I'd stand over there if I was you," because a fight was about to break up out over the other side. You know, that that kind of thing. Um, they will warn you if they like you. <laughs> if they don't, then you know, goodness me. <laughs> but I no, I don't feel vulnerable. I I feel kind of in general, um, more safe in a prison than I do outside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is it Brian next? Can I see? Uh, Bernadette then... Chen. She's been waiting for ages. Chen. Sorry. Thank you, Elizabeth. I can only see one screen. That's uh, my challenge, isn't it? So Chen, you go next. And I think I've got Brian and Vin also that I've seen with hands up. So. Thanks, Bernadette. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Jo, it's been really informative so far. I've really found what you've talked about really enlightening. Um, I had two questions, please. One is sort of quite brief, and the other one perhaps digs into a slightly deeper issue. The quick one is, um, I was kind of um, wondering how, when you mentioned sort of, I had funerals, what sort of did you mean exactly? Is it that a member of staff goes to um, the funeral of a family member of a prisoner, and then the, um, prisoner can watch it on uh, Zoom or something. I just didn't quite understand that. And I'd be quite interested to know. Right, um, right. Yeah. Um, my second question was, um, you've mentioned that you are more or less involved in every aspect of prisoners' life. Um, uh, I think you said 
um, if there's addiction, uh, if they have a disability and they need um, access to specific facilities or and if they try to self-harm then you attend psychiatric meetings and you also provide a lot of support to uh, the prison staff. Um, I suppose firstly what kind of strategies do you take to sort of try and prioritize and actually make what's kind of um, to you perhaps the most important tasks and how do you ensure that kind of you get them done despite the fact that you've um, got so much to do and I guess the second <laughs> part is do you yeah do you, it just seems like so much and do you ever feel like you're picking up the slack for kind of understaffing on other sides and perhaps it actually isn't um uh in the, there also needs to be someone else that deals specifically with a uh, particular issue those are really good questions and can I, i'm just going to address the last one first because um a few weeks ago i was head in hands i uh, <laughs> we are just i'm so tired of being a glorified social worker that was how i just felt on that moment and um, we are very understaffed. And during COVID, there were a lot of staff um, in the business hub that weren't there. It's not my task to pick up disabilities, etc. cetera. But um, someone might say, um, you know, something might be missed. In general, our, um, our safer custody, uh, well, not in general, but our safer custody team are amazing and they pick up disabilities. We have, um, we also have nurses who are well-being nurses and they they take care of guys that was just kind of um it was kind of a throwaway remark just because someone asked me the other day about something and he was saying to me he said to me I've not been able to get in touch with my um well-being nurse can you get in touch with me with her for me it's that kind of thing sometimes those um those uh things need highlighting and um, he couldn't get to the Unilink to, to get in touch with his well-being nurse so um, and staff were too busy to pick up on it so it that's really where where those things happen um, attending things like meetings and um, say for custody meetings and um, Joe, you've just got on to mute. mute. Okay. That's better, so thank I think you. I think I was trying to get to see um, Cho again because I couldn't see her and I, I wanted to see her face to, to, to answer the question. Um, I can see you, Bernadette. <laughs> so um, so what, what happens is that all the disciplines in the prison will attend a meeting because we all have an input. So if we know a prisoner from the, the, um, the particular position we're in, we will take that information. So for instance, let me give you an example, not of somebody, but um, there might be a particular prisoner who's being discussed as a very complex case. So within that, there will be a mental health um, member of staff. There will be a member of the discipline staff from his wing. There will be his probation officer, offender manager. There will be um, someone from, um, say, security. And then there might be me. And I will um, maybe offer something that is of use that other people don't know about this particular prisoner. Um, sometimes we'll have put the stuff on their notes. It's called NOMIS, um, where, where the notes in, for, for prisoners are called NOMIS. So sometimes we'll have put that stuff on the notes or they can check that. But sometimes there might be something, I might have seen someone that morning and just said, ah, oh, that's really interesting because I saw him this morning and he said, blah, blah, blah. So that's the sort of thing that we take to um, meetings. And often we'll pick up something that might help as well. And that we can take back to another chaplain who has that person on their, um, on their particular list to go and see. At the moment, I have two people on my list that I go and see every week. 
Um, the other thing that we do is that we, um, we, it's, we, we will go and see people when they're discharged. So about three months before they're discharged. At the moment, there are very few dis dis discharges because there's a lot of life sentences. So when someone's discharged or um, it, it doesn't happen that much. So prioritizing and strategizing, those meetings um, are meetings that we have to go to. Um, so every, um, every day there's a meeting that a chaplain goes to. Um, we take it in turns. We're supposed to take it in turns, but some chaplains prefer some meetings. So, um, uh, you know, we have to fight to get to them. But um, those meetings and then um, meetings such as in the segregation wing where uh, prisoners have been sent for poor behaviour on the wing um, and some prisoners who um, have maybe done something like attack a member of staff and, and um, they're waiting to be moved to either another prison or to something called the um, CSC, which is the coast supervision, which is where prisoners who've hurt other prisoners or, or maybe killed another prisoner even in, in prison, that's where they might be sent. So they might be in that, in that place for quite a while. So we'll attend that meeting. And so that's called a segregation um, review. We, there are so many meetings in a prison Chaplains do try and attend a few of them. One of the best meetings that we can go to are, we haven't had one for a while, but I used to go to these a lot. They're um, meetings about making um, a, a, a restorative prison really. And that's a, you know, a prison where people are not just serving their time, but are, um, are serving it in a way which is useful for them and for others. That I used to enjoy those meetings, but during COVID, those haven't happened. The other meetings are um, prisoner council meetings. So prisoners have um, a, a council meeting once a month and they bring issues from their wing. Um, they're a, a source of great frustration and also a source of um, joy sometimes when something happens. So they each have a representative. Um, so we, we prioritize meetings because they're important and we get, to, we, get to, um, we get to either hear about prisoners that we know more about or we, one of the, the, the meetings that we go to the most are the ACT meetings and we might go to about four of them a day for up to, I've been to seven in a day. And that's prisoners who are um, on a, a self-harm or suicide document and they've either try to take their own lives or they they are in a in a um a critical it's a critical document they're in crisis so um we will go and see those and i've got um a couple of men on my list at the moment who have been in crisis and we try and get them out of crisis and we have to visit them every day um other things are not meetings but i'm going to throw that in is um, when we get new new people in the prison. So someone new has to be seen within 24 hours. So um, that's, um, those are either transfers from another prison or they are, um, in our prison, we don't get people from the courts. Forest Bank does, but we don't. We sometimes get people from Forest Bank, um, but we have to see people within 24 hours. Um, let me just ask you. Um, yeah, we, we don't, the psychiatrists, we, we, we don't have input into those kind of meetings. Psychiatrists are um, based in, in the mental health department and they, they, we tend not to see them. Um, they are their own people really. Um, I've said them a lot. So um, d does that help at all? Has that answered your question? Yes, I think that makes sense. So. Um, if I have understood correctly, you have... Oh, the iPad, iPad. Let me tell you about the iPad. Well, during COVID, what prisoners can only go to the funeral of a parent, a sibling, or a child. Um, during COVID, that wasn't happening. For the same for everybody in the community. Um, what happens is that we have two iPads in the prison and 
instead of going to the funeral, we will link in with somebody who either has uh, a phone or an iPad there, that's a relative usually, um, or on the system within the, 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 um, the place where the funeral's held. So the prisoner will sit um, somewhere in the prison, it, 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 sometimes the chapel, uh, and sometimes in one of the visits area, and they will attend the funeral by iPad. That's all, that's, that's the way it happens. And um, yeah, because we can't always get them out. And sometimes prisoners aren't even allowed to go out. If they're big gang members, sometimes they're not allowed to go out because of risk to the public or risk to them, risk to the family um, or risk to staff as well. So um, the iPad has actually served its, its um, it, it, the iPad funerals have been quite interesting and I've been to a few of those. So been a few glitches, but yeah, we can see manage it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jill. That's really helpful. really helpful. Thank you. Some more insight into what you're doing. Uh, Vin, I think you're next, and then um, I think I've got and I've got Brian and Sheila. Did you say me? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to go next, Vin? Yeah. Uh, Joe, you you come across as a, a a very caring, very genuine sort of person. You must be quite special to do the job that you do. No. But you're also able to talk about it in some ways in a very practical manner. Day to day in your dealings with prisoners or the staff even, there must be times when there's a conflict between your emotions and being practical or pragmatic. And I just wonder how you handle that. How do you manage to, at times, suppress emotions when they must be there fighting to get out? Mm. Um, that's a really, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, I don't always handle it. Sometimes I, I might have a, a cry on the way home. Um, it, and I'm not, I am very passionate about what I do, but I also get very tired. And um, I don't think, I think that happens to a lot of chaplains. I'm one of the oldest in my team. Um, and so, you know, I've got more years on everyone. I'm the longest serving in my team. And um, that's a lot of stories uh, that I carry. And sometimes, um, sometimes it's hard when you have to give news of death to people. I have to go and uh, I might go and take five minutes and sit in the chapel. But I have to be professional as well. And I have to then go to someone else. Um, and I think I mentioned at the very beginning that my one of my safe places was my friend Stu, who was um, my spiritual confidant. And when I had issues like that, he would phone me up and he always knew. And we would talk and we would pray together. And he's not there now. He's, he's gone to God. So that's a bit tricky. I have to find someone else. We, we need to have spiritual direction. And there are times, I mean, my my... Is I am very practical at work. We have to be very practical. There are lots of boxes to tick. Being a chaplain now isn't the same as being a chaplain when I first started 16 years ago. It's not the same. And, you know, there's more required of us, more boxes, more audits, more, you know, very practical things to do. And I don't enjoy those things. I don't enjoy them. I would be happy to go in, walk on the wings, have banter, laugh you know just listen to to the difficult stories and not tick any boxes um and sometimes and this might sound really crazy it's the ticking the boxes that is hard because i'm ticking the box that that means that i've just seen somebody who has had a major life change you know someone has died they they will never see that person again they carry guilt because they weren't there and um, you know they, they, they maybe someone's mother has died and um, they're gonna have they know that um, that they'll never see them again and that they're disappointed maybe they carry all this stuff. A lot of our stuff is saying is talking about how you know um, ah talking about that let's go to something that's quite interesting. 
one of the best things that I that, that we do is when there is a death, we take somebody down. Candles are really important in prison. So we take somebody to the chapel. I carry a radio um, and I can um, go and collect somebody from their wing and bring them to the to the chapel. It's the first prison I've been able to do that and apart from a cat C. Um, and we take them down there. Someone has died. I want to light a candle. Can you take me? So we'll take them to the chapel. They light their candles. We sit. Sometimes I have sat for 10 minutes in total silence with somebody. And whilst that is hard, it's also, it's a privilege and it's also healing because it's about being able to hold that space for people and not have something to say there's nothing I can say into it at all there's nothing that I can say to somebody who has lot who, whose mother has died whose father has died will never see them again and can't necessarily go to the funeral there's nothing I can say so holding that space for 10 minutes is incredibly rich and incredibly big and is almost healing in itself because it's the one thing I can do for somebody so um some of the, the, the some of the more difficult things, um, some of the things that I see maybe uh, that I can't change and that I can't do something about, they're the things that hurt, and 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 I carry those, and I'm not always very good at carrying them. I I do get um, I do get quite. Um, yeah, I can come home. I think one of the places that it shows, I'm quite honest about this, one of the places that it shows is, 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 um, is, is walking through Manchester to get the train home maybe, or sitting on the train and, and, and looking at the carelessness of, 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 of life sometimes, the carelessness that, that people might, snippets of conversation maybe, where, you know, um, and those things are, are, are more difficult to hold than the difficult conversations in prison. Um, you know, uh, I, I sat one night on, it was a Sunday afternoon. I'd just been in prison and I'd just done um, a service for uh, some of the Cat A men. And I got, to, um, I got to Manchester Piccadilly and there was a fight, football fans. And that carelessness is more painful than being in prison because they, someone one of those men pushed another and in my head I'm thinking you have just done this you could have killed him that one thing that you did could have kept you 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 could be in prison you could have taken that life and that's a very different I find that harder than actually being in prison because um because it's a carelessness and um do you, do you am I making my sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's harder than being in prison. Yeah. Because I've seen I've seen what happens. I've seen the result of those care of that carelessness. And um I, I kind of want to shake people as well. So that's quite hard. Um yeah. but I am I am quite passionate, but I'm also quite tired. And um, you know, we need to, I have to preserve my space outside of prison as well. This is lovely, this is different because this is about something that I really care about. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, I think chaplains, even when I've retired, I think I will still care very much about, about prison because it's, in never, my, it's not going to stop. You'll never stop caring. Stop. Yeah. Can I just finally so just say, you use the phrase, walking on wings. That sounds quite angelic to me. <laughs> no, I'm not, it's not, there's nothing angelic about it. But, um, and it's an amazing place. Like, you know, you walk on a wing and, you know, it's immediately, it's, um, hey, miss, how are you? You know, you're always miss. And um, how are you doing, miss? And sometimes people will just go, who are you? What do you do? Because we we get new men in and and um, and not very often at the moment. But um, what do you do? And I'll say oh, I'm a chaplain. What it is, Miss, is and then you'll get you'll, you'll they'll tell you something they want. Or um, 
or sometimes people just want to um you know just have someone to talk to that isn't wearing a uniform as well and I mean we've got some amazing uniform staff uh, uh, you know so and they will some of them go out of their way to help so um but at the moment we're very understaffed so that's quite hard so we do take up slack a little bit yeah. at a time but you know I work in a good team and every you know all the chaplains that I work with are um absolutely dedicated to the to the people that they work with one of the things that we do is we we have a lot we work a lot with diversity issues as well and one of our chaplains is um is has just received an award for diversity so um and race um so we, we chaplains are our chaplains are very um we're there to care about everything every aspect if jesus cared about it we care about it almost mm -hmm. you know um equality diversity um power you know where's the power and and mm -hmm. and uh, we're very political as well um and prison is just prison is also um i mean it's a big place it's a big place in terms of um social justice but it's um prisoners of as you, you you probably know prison is a political football and every single um we're constantly trying to to deal with whatever happens with each you know each new justice minister or um you know underfunding we're one of the most underfunded resources and um you know bearing in mind that what we do protects the public we are very underfunded really so. Thank, you. thank you thank you joe that's great brian would you like to come in just need to unmute yourself thank you my wife has unmuted me um then i'll do without her in the course of that i can only see our, our leader i can't see the person that we're, i'm talking to but never mind um in the course of your answer just then, you almost answered my query. Many years ago, my wife was a counsellor for Catholic marriage care. And I went along as her chaperone. Uh, chaperone. And quite often when she came away from it, she was more than a little tense, but the organization of marriage care meant that she also had a supervisor, which she went to not infrequently. And she was a, that lady was able to suggest things to calm Anna down and to get her back onto the right level. And I do wonder what Joe was saying sounded so intense and complicated. And I do wonder if she has something comparable to that she can turn to and offers her advice. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, well, I've mentioned Stuart a few times and, you know, I don't, I've got to replace Stuart now. <laughs> I can't replace Stuart. That was a terrible thing. Um, but Stuart was... Um, Stuart was my, he was the first prison chaplain that I ever worked with and a dear friend. And I would, um, Stuart would, uh, he was there for me um, all, always when it came to prison stuff. Um, I have, um, I am married to Tony, who uh, was um, trained as a drama therapist. So I can come home and, um, I'm allowed to give um, usually around about five minutes of kind of offloading, but no names. Um, so that's OK. I don't have a, a professional supervision, but I do have training. So I go on training courses. Um, the last training course I went was on a, a more intense counselling skills for chaplains. Um, and that was that was that was good. There are people that I can talk to if I if I want to access. Um, we have professional development. Um, it's, 
we talk to each other maybe, I think more. Um, some of my um, some of my Muslim colleagues are um, really good at um, what they do is they make us sit down. So we, and, that, and that's one of the good things about, um, about being in a multi-faith team. So we sit down and we will offload to each other, maybe. Um, we will um, we'll talk about, uh, you know, maybe, maybe something that's, that was really difficult. We'll sit and have a chat with each other. And we are professionals, so I guess that's, you know, that, that works. Um, just occasionally, I will go and talk with um, one of our mental health nurses. And that's quite, that's, that's quite interesting. So I'll maybe go and say, uh, you know, I'm feeling this, this and this, you know, what do you suggest? Um, how do you suggest I approach this with this particular person, with this particular prisoner? Um, and I suppose we do get, we do really get, um, we can access it. We have things through the prison, uh, through the prison um, system. There is uh, something called um, trim training. So if we experience a trauma, we can go and access uh, the trauma, um, the, the, the trauma counselors in our prison. Um, we have um, some, we have like a talking therapy that we can go to if we want. I've never, I've only accessed them once. And that was when I was in the, in a dispersal prison. And um, I accessed someone once, still friends with her actually. Uh, she was brilliant. There is stuff there if we want, you know. Um, but the biggest thing, the biggest thing is uh, chaplains, I think from other prisons, I've got a few friends who are chaplains in other prisons and we pray with each other. And uh, last December, round about this time, I went on a retreat with one of them online. So those are the things that we can access. Um, we um, were supposed to take a retreat once a year. Um, I need to do that, I need to book that. Um, I've got a couple of friends who are psychotherapists and who work in prison. So that's another outlet that I can go to. Uh, it's there if I want it. It's there if I want it. Thank you, Jo. So it's good to, to hear that you've got that, that support and perhaps from a range of different places, depending on what the situation is. So mm -hmm. um, if we can move on to Sheila next. Hi. Um, Hi, Sheila. Hello. I've got uh, three questions. And um, firstly, you mentioned um, old traditional rules that you follow, like seeing prisoners within a certain number of hours that they arrive. Mm. And I know um, a doctor friend of mine, it was a term of her contract that she had to eat so many meals in the prison. So I was wondering if there are any more rules for example do you have a rule that's about external reporting if you see something that you think is wrong systemically in the prison do you as a chaplain have a duty to report to some external body and secondly i was wondering what will christmas be like for you and the prison in a prison will it be a non-event or will it be a depressing time or what and how will the chaplains uh, rise to it, cope with it. And thirdly, external events. I wonder if they have a big impact on your job inside the prison. So if something happens like the Ariana Grande bomb in Manchester, will you as a chaplaincy team, Muslim and Christian, you said you, um, you know, you, you watch each, other, each other's backs. Will you as a team know that you'll have to um, present a joint approach to, to some external event. Right, yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Sheila. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll answer the... Um, yeah, uh, 
if I still if I see something that is absolutely wrong in a prison, we have um, a department called counter corruption. So they deal with um, corruption inside prison. And um, if I see something, I I report it to them. And um, they're kind of handpicked, very, very handpicked people and have been very helpful to me. Uh, every prison has an, a counter corruption team. And they, um, they, they're about keeping prison safe, keeping prisoners safe, keeping staff safe. If I thought that they weren't doing their job and Uh, yeah, I have every confidence in that. If I thought they weren't, um, then I would be absolutely, I would have to go outside. I'd have to go outside, you know. It's whistleblowing, isn't it? Um, when I worked for a, a, a charity, um, Packed Prison Advice Care Trust, I actually co-wrote a whistleblowing, um, uh, I can't think of the name, what's it called? A whistleblowing... Um, can't think what they're called. Anyway, I wrote something about whistleblowing. And because I did have to do that in one prison. And um, I, I did, I did have to do that. And that was not easy. But that, that was, um, that was dealt with within the prison, and, um, and dealt with quite well. So we, I wouldn't be afraid to go to our counter corruption people that that's because we have to be safe and if we don't then we're not keeping people safe and that's it doesn't matter who it is we we, we have to go so that's very important um next thing was our uh, old traditional rules <laughs> well they're, they're kind of legal requirements really seeing someone within 24 hours it, the reason is that um, within that 24 hours, they, they have to be seen by a multidisciplinary team, really, to check their medical um, issues, to check their mental health issues. And um, we ask questions. So we'll ask them, have you got any self-harm issues? Have you, we all go and do that induction. What is your, do you have a religious, um, do you have a religious registration? Have you talked to your family? Do your family know you're here in this prison? There's a checklist. One of, the, um, one of them is, have you phoned your family? And if they haven't been able to, um, unless they're cat A, we phone the family. If they're cat A, we have to get permission. Um, so we will phone to see if they, if, if they've, um, if that people they know, people they, they, their families know if they're there. Um, within the 24 hours, they have to be seen by a chaplain. So we need to know whether they're well, about their well-being. So that, that's quite important. Um, religious registration is important because sometimes they're like a rabbit in the headlights, you know, and they, they'll, they'll come and say, no, I, I haven't got a religion. But actually, you find out later on that, that they do have a religious requirement. It's just that they they haven't been able to think properly or, or whatever. Um, so we, that's, that's why we do those. Eating in prison, well, um, we have to have, we look after ourselves. So within six hours, we have to, within six hours, we have to have eaten. Not necessarily with prisoners. And we've just in Manchester started to get kitchens because we're taking more long-term prisoners again. So um, we've started getting kitchen, kitchens and prisoners can cook. So. At some point, I will be partaking of, um, you know, a, a birthday cake or two. <laughs> so that's quite nice. Um, it used to happen in Whitemore. We had a, one guy on there who was an excellent cook and made birthday cakes. And um, they were quite nice. So uh, Christmas is often a very difficult time because, um, because the guys, they miss their families. They're not there again for their families. One of the things that I um, that we do, I, I've done it a few years, but this year we did it together, is something called Angel Tree, and it's through Prison Fellowship. And Prison Fellowship will um, buy gifts for uh, the family of prisoners. And so I go round 
um, we go around and we give out, some of my colleagues did this as well, we give out a form and the guys fill it in with the name and address of um, their children, uh, the carer of their children, and a gift tag. So they'll write a gift tag and they'll say on there what, what, um, what they think their child would enjoy. And I will send that, that off to somebody who does that. The person who does it for us does it as style as well so um she will go and buy presents for all of those men's children for, for all the children of those of, of our prisoners and she's she's done all of them now so they are packed and gift wrapped and sent off to um to the children of, of some of the men who partake in the scheme and that brings a lot of joy to some of them so it helps minimize the the difficulties it is difficult for, for, for some of them. And we, we pay particular attention to, to the pain of that. We, um, we at Christmas, oh, hang on, I need to put my, um, just a minute. Can I just ask something? Tony, Tony, Tony. All right, sorry, I'll just, I, I'm gonna have to plug this in because my um the battery's low um can you see me yeah so um one one of the things that we um we do is we have a carol service and the 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 guys um quite enjoy that um we I'm in on Christmas morning, so we're not having mass this year because we're still out of, we're not in stage one yet in the prisons. And if you think about COVID, it, it just goes around a prison like mad. So um, we're not in stage one yet. So we'll be having an ecumenical service. And then what will happen is that we'll, um, we'll go around and um, maybe take just a kind of a little chocolate bar or something to, to, to the guys. Um, we, um, we go and see staff who are working because that's not easy because they're not with their families and they work long shifts. And um, so that every every Christmas we're in. Uh, Christmas isn't necessarily it's not necessarily depressing. But it's not easy. It's not an easy time for them. And we do try and make it. And this year there are things like there's a a Christmas tree um, competition. So uh, some of the staff and, and some of the prisoners will decorate a tree, which will be actually not on the wing, but in something called a, a sterile area, which is where we go through gates to get onto the wing. So they'll, they'll leave that there and there's the competition. And, you know, there are little things like that which, which help. Um, our safer custody, one of our safer custody officer like um, streams films so he's looking out at the moment for really nice Christmas films um, or anything else you know die hard because obviously that's a Christmas film isn't it um, but 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 it's just it's stuff like that really that is the little things that, that will get people through and you know contrary to popular belief prison is not just a miserable place it's also um, I have laughed so hard in prison I have laughed till I've cried with some prisoners we um we will um there's a lot of humor in prison it has to be to get us through and um and you know i mean i i'll tell you this I'll, this this is a joke i tell this joke constantly and it's to to, to new people not the same people um how did the banana get out of prison you won on appeal. Well, that is the worst joke ever, but you have no idea how many groans and laughs that gets. And, um, you know, it's, we laugh, we laugh in prison. I've, I've, and also I've had some of the best conversations ever in prison with, with prisoners. I've had, I've had really meaningful conversations that have actually um, been life enhancing. I wouldn't have stayed for seven. I wouldn't have been a chaplain for 16 years if it was that depressing you know um 
I've got a great, great capacity for misery, but I also need to, um, I also need to laugh and we laugh, you know, um, I laugh with my colleagues, I laugh with staff and um, laugh with prisoners. It's sometimes, it's hilarious at times, but it's also makes you cry. So it's tricky. Was there another one in there? Um, oh, external events. Well, as if there is um, a, 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 an external event um, in a, such as say, for instance, the Westminster, um, I worked in Whitemore actually, where um, Jack, who was murdered, um, he, 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 he used to go in there. I worked in Whitemore for a number of years and that, that does throw staff, stuff like that will throw staff, but you'll get an alert system in a prison. So there's, um, you know, you go to high alert um, in a prison and everyone's a bit more, it doesn't make a great deal of difference because quite often we're on high alert. That doesn't really change. Um, I, haven't, I haven't seen a, a minimal alert for God, I've never seen one. We're always on high alert, I think really at the moment. Um, there are things that happen like, you know, when Prince Philip died, there was, the, the flag is lowered. Remembrance Day in one prison I work was tricky because of terrorists and extremists, they, um, and the potential for, for difficulties, but that never kind of plays out. A lot of the things that the press discuss or that the press kind of say are gonna be difficulties, they're not. And, um, you know, our, our press likes to, um, it likes to uh, dramatize prison events, but it often it's just, there's a lot of mundanity in there as well. Um, but there, we do go to high alert with external, with external issues. So. Thank you. Now I can see that Jen, you'd like to ask another question, but can I just see if there's anybody else who would like to raise anything? Um, Trying to make sure I'm seeing everybody. No, everybody else is, is okay. Chen, do you want to come back in then with further questions? Uh, that would be great. Thanks very much for letting me um, ask another question. Um, I think um, I was thinking about an external event that affects um, prisoners in quite a unique way is every time there's uh, a general election um, because there's in the UK a blanket uh, ban, I think, on prisoners voting. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether um, that's uh, that ever kind of affects prisoners uh, particularly or what is the kind of uh, reaction in prisons and what, uh, what kind of atmosphere is it to, um, when, whenever there's a general election? Um, and then secondly, I would perhaps like to ask, um, I felt quite interested when Sheila mentioned um, the, um, when Ariana Grande gave a concert and there was the terrible terrorist attack that, that was actually in Manchester. And it was yeah. very sort of politically and religiously uh, fueled. And, you know, the public discussion afterwards was very politically and religiously fueled as well. I was wondering, wondering, seen as that was in Manchester and the prison is in Manchester, whether uh, it had a particular effect or is it, like you said, for most if events, the media sort of does is that exaggerate the effect that it might have in a prison. Thank you. Right. Okay, thanks, Cho. Um, prisoners know, Often they're quite polite. They can't. There, there are some quite um, some 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 of the guys I've known who've had quite um, strong views on politics and um, very. Um, they're all aware that we have a you know change of regime and and things will uh, they will be affected. They're all aware of that. Um, in general, I would say that that most of them, the ones that I. I've had these conversations with are more concerned about um, the issues within which justice minister is going to look at things like um, the IPP status. So getting rid of IPPs, you know, indeterminate sentences, which were a 
challenge to human rights, absolutely devastating challenge to human rights. And we've got prisoners um, in our system who, um, who they have so many, there are so many courses and so many things they're supposed to do um, in order to leave prison, but there aren't the courses quite often. So some of them are stuck in a loop and um, that's quite hard. So they have quite strong views on that, on, 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 just, on, on justice ministers. In general, most, most of them are about surviving. So, you know, it, it, it's not, it's, you know, the, the last, the last um, governmental, uh, the last, the last um, election, it, it was really, um, we just kind of got on with dealing day to day with everything. And people were basically, well, you know, what's going to change, you know, um, but we, we, it does change, justice ministers change. And um, I think that that's the one thing that people know affects, affects um, our prisons. Um, I was reading, I was reading something recently um, by, uh, and it's interesting, it's a very interesting thing here that uh, the prison inspectorate tend to be more quite vocal about prisons. They, they, they know that the, the, the prison system, they have things to audit, but they also know that the prison system fails a lot of prisoners. And, um, our, our, the, our last prison inspector, chief inspector, his name's just gone, I can't think of his name, really nice guy. When he was coming to the end of his tenure, he, um, he became very vocal about issues that, um, that, that the government had, um, had ignored. And I, I had a feeling then that actually um, it's quite difficult to be very vocal when, the gov when that government's in, 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 in power. And, and towards the end of his tenure, I can't think of his name, it's just, just gone. He became very vocal about, about the ways that, that the prison system had been failed by, by the government. And I, let me just look at the rest of that question. Um, It's, a, it's such a big, um, do you know what, I'm struggling because it's so big for me, this, that I, I, I don't quite know how to answer it in a kind of a nutshell. Um, you know, because, because I also have some very strong views about the way that, 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 that government sees prison, you know, very, very strong views. And, I, and because this has been recorded, I'm kind of mindful. I don't necessarily want to overstep that. I, um, prisons aren't sexy are they you know it's it's not a vote winner um and do you know what can i can i just read something that I, I i wrote this this was something that i wrote and i think this speaks to something that you're you're talking about in a in a way which i can kind of i can kind of discuss rather than as a christian i think really yeah, I can understand the difficulty. And yeah, sure, that would be helpful. I think I, I'm going to do that. Um, the verse, verse 14 of, um, it was Isaiah, I think. I can't remember. I have to go to the top, but we, I don't have the time to do that. Um, I'll tell you the link. I'll tell you the, the, the verse in a minute. And you will be founded in justice. I really think that here we can see that perhaps God, God is about a justice that still recognises you, the prisoner, as a person with a capacity to love and grow and change. The outside or society or in, you know, governments <laughs> has the right to incarcerate you, but that is not the last word. So what I'm trying to say is that we have a justice system and then we have what, what we should have. <laughs> um, but 
all of us that hope or this that, that verse which is isaiah i'll tell you in a second reminds all of us that hope is something that we must remind those who oversee our criminal justice system to care about. It's not enough just to leave governments and, and, and you know, um, justice ministers to, to oversee prisons. We have to be far more vocal. I've been quite vocal here with our MP and I have throughout my chaplain, with, throughout the, my career as a chaplain, been very vocal and written lots of letters. Um, because they can't be trusted really with our with our prison system it's up to us as christians it's up to us as also as humanists as as people to to keep reminding govern, government that these are people and that they can end up in prison you know anybody could end up in prison so um we <laughs> There is the outside, there is government, and then there is prison. And all of us, I see, I see all of us in prison as this little kind of um, mi microcosm of, 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 of the world almost, that there are people who don't care, there are people who do care, there are people who struggle, there are people who have things done to them, there are people who are trying to enable think people to do stuff. And almost, what happens outside, yes, it affects us, but we are too busy to allow it to affect us, if you see what I mean. It, governments change, justice ministers change, but nothing much happens, nothing much changes inside because um, almost we're still gonna be doing the things that we have to do as human beings for other human beings. And um, which actually brings me very smartly, very smartly to this. If God cares about hope, then that's what we must be about. Um, it is not enough to imagine that because there are people inside prison struggling to keep hope alive, that that is enough. If I could ask one thing today, it would be that that, that all of us here might find ways of learning about our prison system, about working to effect a change in the thinking of those with the power to build prisons and determine how they are run. Whether that is through budget setting or interventions and the two are linked, very linked, and perhaps by looking at opportunities to volunteer in prison chaplaincies or mentor a released prisoner, for instance, through community chaplaincy initiatives. These are the ways perhaps in which the justice of God, of which Isaiah speaks so beautifully, might be felt by prisoners who deal daily with the shame of their youth. And um, Isaiah's vision was of a just society in which pain is turned into precious stones. So I will go up and find that verse now. Isaiah 54, if that, that, that was um, that was the verse that I that I used for that particular homily, and um, you know, governments only do enough to look as though they're doing enough. They do, they're not they never really do enough. There was one justice minister. Um, uh, K Kenneth Clark. Um, in 2011 asked for a survey and I completed that survey it was a great survey it had that many questions it was a very full survey Kenneth Clark was a QC he was a conservative and um, and possibly one of the best justice ministers we've we've had really um but he he was different to everybody else he cared and he took the findings of this survey to Westminster and he wanted to affect change. He gave his findings and if I'm correct, within weeks, he was moved to another department. And I think that just speaks volumes. You know, the prison system 
is um, this is where justice and peace, you know, because I could talk all day about what a chaplain does, but we're here. This is a justice and peace. Um, it's a justice and peace talk. And at the very root of everything that we do in prison as chaplains is justice and peace. And it is that particular, um, that Isaiah 54 is about justice and peace. And, you know, I, we have to do, we have to do what we have to do regardless. Um, is it a calling? Yes, it's a calling, I guess regardless of um, government changes and government regimes. We could have another party in next time. And um, I, I, I'd hope that there would be a different attitude towards incarceration. Um, but you know, you know as well as I do that, um, that law and order is a big vote winner. But people yes, don't yes, always I can, understand. I can completely understand what you're saying, <laughs> yeah. I think whether it be sort of Labour saying they want to be tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, or the current government, it's sort of like a big vote winner if you actually take the, um, often if governments take the really awful position that sort of prisoners are kind of low life and they're scum, that's often actually horrifically a vote winner. And then it all gets very political. You mentioned yeah. sort of uh, whole life sentences as well. You know, the European Court of Human Rights have have declared that this UK law isn't um, compatible with the convention, but mm. the government then kind of uh, got kind of more votes by defying that and not changing the law. I also understand what you're saying in that on the ground level, there are uh, people like you and also you shared that kind of conviction with other staff members and uh, volunteers that on the groundwork there's got to be people trying to affect change. Always and um, and it's hard you know because um, there's very little money the budgets are very slim for prisons I mean they've just you know it, it's a it's a, always a drop in the ocean and um, you know if you if you tell people you know someone who's someone whose car has just been um just been robbed and they're living in in a place where crime is is quite high you know the idea that you vote for a government that will imprison them throw away the key you know that's very attractive so you'll vote sometimes for that it takes an awful lot of thought and 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 i have don't think I have ever really heard, apart from um, a few politicians, discuss restorative justice or restoration of people. Because unless you put those courses, unless you, unless you have the money invested in prisons, those people are coming out angrier. Um, and they're, then they're coming out to a road near you. They're not, you know, that people want, the, the people I know, on the whole, want change. They don't want to keep coming back to prison. They want a change in their lives. And it's up to us to give them the tools. But if the money isn't there, you're going to have people keep coming. And so it's a, the revolving door. And, um, and I've seen that, and it's awful. Um, and so we, we need to be constantly pressurising um, government to look at... The, the consequences of that revolving door on our societies and, um, you know, locking up more people. We're just, they've just built a new, I think it's a 2000 person capacity prison in Leicestershire. We don't need more prisons. We need to, I, I, I read, um, because, you know, we'll, be, we'll end up like America, you know, big business. I, I, I read something um, the, the other day, it was a tweet. And, and this tweet said, um, we, in prison, we incarcerate some of the most damaged people in society in crumbling old Victorian edifices, and we expect change. You know, it says it all for me. And that's, that's why we need to, we need to um, keep up that pressure as, as people who care, as people who care in just, about justice and peace, because 
for every prisoner, almost every prisoner, there's also a family, there are children, and statistics show that where there is a parent in prison, the child is more likely to go as well, a, a child is more likely to end up there. So we need to be, there are some amazing people, there are amazing, um, you know, in our prison, um, our visits are um, run by partners of prisoners. So they're a charity, uh, uh, people who've had partners in prison. And so they, they care, you know, so most of what we, um, most of, of the, the stuff that goes on is, um, sorry, most, there's an awful lot of stuff in prison that is charitable. So, you know, but we need to keep up the pressure. Thanks, Joe. that's great. Thank you very much for that. We, we're sort of coming towards the end of our time, but we, so we've just, I think, got Fiona next and then we'll wind up after that, if that's OK. I know. Am I getting a bit waffly? Because I'm starting to worry I'm getting waffly. You, you're giving us lots of rich information. That uh -huh. goes, so. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Joe. Thank you Hi. very much for your talk so far. It's been really, really fascinating and insightful and, uh, and yeah, enriching. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but you sort of actually just touched on them both um, just now. One is, um, I, I had a friend who who I know through my um, through my faith as well. Who's uh, I'm a Quaker, and oh, um, <laughs> and, oh, my husband um, used to work for Quakers. Yeah. Oh right, right. Um, she. Um, a few years ago, she used to work for a prison charity. I can't remember the name of it um, that actually worked for prisoners, sort of trying to help with prisoners get their rights met and their well-being. Okay. Um, and then she decided to go on to the other side and she became a prison inspector. Right. Oh, no, they're great. Uh, prison inspectors are fabulous. Right. Right. Well, she so she found it really, really difficult doing that job um, because uh, well one of the main things was because she was a woman so it's sort of quite interesting that you uh, not not from the um, prisoners but mainly from well the, the the inspectorate service which she found was very very old school civil service oh that's interesting and very male dominated um, very condescendingly male dominated oh, interesting. Um, and so obviously that's not something you've experienced but I also wondered how do you have a voice um, to the governor I mean what how much power yeah. do the governors have well a governor is only as good as um, as his senior managers as his other governors yeah because they alert him to stuff but um no, our, our governor's great. And, um, you know, we, we see him a lot. And he moved his offices um, into, the, into the prison. So, you know, he wanted to be where the, 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 the noise is, really. And yeah. he's, a really, he's a really nice guy, um, very, very um, conscientious, very caring. And, um, you know, we often see him around. Uh, we, we bob into the office to say hi, say how are you, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a chain of command. So, um, you know, if there's an issue on a wing, say we have someone like, we'll have um, a couple of residential governors. So they deal with all the residential issues. And then we will have a, um, we'll have a governor say in charge of security. We'll have a governor in charge of um, visits. You know, so we have a chain of command, so we'll go to them. And I guess, you know, I've, I've, if, if something doesn't work, then we have to go, then we can have access to the governor. Now, prisoners have a very interesting thing because they have a chain of command as well, almost. But mm -hmm. if they feel that they have been discriminated against, that something has happened, that they maybe they've been beaten up or something like that by 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 someone by a member of staff, they can put a seal. They can write a sealed uh, letter and it can go straight to the governor. I've delivered those in the past. 
mm-hmm. and it sits on the governor's desk and no one sees it but the governor mm. um, okay so, oh, so so there is a there is a, a route <laughs> through yeah them. Yes. But as you say, they, they can only, again, you know, it depends on their boss. And, and the other thing I just wanted to comment on, but you, you also touched it as well, because I, I worked for a couple of years. I volunteered for a, a charity called The Forgiveness Project. Yes, I know. The, it's great. I love The Forgiveness Project. Oh, good, good. Yeah, yeah. no, I think they're Marina, fantastic. Um, Marina. Marina Cantacuzino. Oh. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, so um, I learned a lot, you know, two years and, and, and of course they were doing workshops in prisons, um, but it was found that the workshops were so successful, the government stopped the funding for them because of the, the whole, as you say, the, the, and the, 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 you know, they do a lot with restorative justice. But, yeah. but one of the really frightening things I learned when I was working for them, gosh, it was about 10 years ago now, um, you know, with the increasing privatization of prisons, of course, those prisons, the, the, the company's priority is making money for their shareholders. It's not to have a low filled prison. Yes, exactly. And so you know, what did we have? We had, we had Chris Grayling privatizing probation. So whose interests? Yeah. yeah. These yeah. are the things that affect, these are the things that really affect people. Yeah. And, um, and also one of those things that happened was that, um, that, that when Chris Grayling came in, he's not a very popular man in prisons, Chris Grayling, mm-hmm. but he's not, I don't think he was very popular anyway, was he? But, no. <laughs> um, but he, one of the things that he did, and I never forget this, apart from banning books being sent in, yeah, yeah, no, I thought that was disgusting. Really was disgusting. Inhumane. Inhumane. Shocking. Inhumane. And he also um, gave something I can know, I don't quite know what it stood for, but VEDS. He offered um, a lot of very senior officers the chance to retire with a package. And who wouldn't after a lifetime on the wings, you know? So he offered that. And the idea was that they would recruit all these young staff. And the young staff would come in on a lower pay, so it would save the government money. And it never worked. It didn't work. No. And that's the sort of thing that affects, you know, no, who out there when they're, you know, how many people out there when they're looking at voting or who to vote for, look at stuff like that. But mm. those, are the, those are the very crucial details that affect everybody's life. That mm-hmm. affected that is one of the single most um, changes that I have seen affect prisons. It's phenomenal. And, mm-hmm. and, and that will echo down the years. It's not gone away. We have recruit, we, we got rid of so many older staff and they have recruited younger staff. Um, you know, who, are, who are less experienced. And, mm-hmm. yep. and, and they're being taught by younger staff. And so now, and then morale gets low, and yep. some of the staff who are still very good, um, they get tired. Um, it, it's 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 not good. It's not good. But he did that, and that that will reverberate through the years. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, you know, it 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 changed also. It changed my salary. You know, so I left for a few years, and when I came back, I came back in on a new starter salary instead of coming back on with someone who's so experienced if and now i i would do it for free at, you know not as many hours i do but i would i'd be a volunteer if i was retired but i would still like that salary that i had you know because it would make some things easier but i you know it's it, it's um <coughs> excuse me it, it's you. it's a thank you it's a calling for me isn't it so it's yeah. a different you know uh, it's it's a, it's a vacation and yeah vacation. calling yeah. Mm. yeah oh well thank you sometimes thank i wonder you. about mm. um but but for some people it isn't so we're not you know i mean that those decisions are um, you know those decisions are have affected so much mm. um, thank you okay yeah. thank you i'd like to say one last thing at the end of Joanne's um, answer to my question, 
I was not blowing her a kiss. I was using British Sign Language to say thank you. No, I know my grandchildren do that. Thank you. Yes. And on behalf of us all, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Brian. Brian. Cheers. <laughs> thank you. Can I just say um, at this point, actually, before before everything sort of shuts down, we we are very thin on the ground with Catholic volunteers. And if there is anybody that would give half a day or a day, you know, as a volunteer, it doesn't have to be the same day every week. It's a volunteer capacity. But someone who would just come in and, and you get training and it's an amazing place and, and just come in and, and just go and visit. You know, we, we, I, you know, we provide a few names. Mr. So-and-so is very low at the moment. Um, you know, his, his father died recently and he's very low. Or M Mr. So-and-so's wife has left him and, you know, she can't, she can't do this all these years. Um, you know, could you go and see them? That's the sort of thing that, that, that is... Volunteers are an amazing asset in a prison and we don't have enough. We really don't. We've got Alpha coming in. Um, they're going to be doing something. Our Anglican chaplain has been um, been been overseeing that. Um, but the Anglicans have far more volunteers than the Catholics. And you know, I I, I don't want to um, you know I don't want to put anybody under any pressure here. But I'd like to see the Catholics win a little bit actually. So um, that would that's, be good. That's, that's brilliant, Joe. Because I. I those of you who will have joined talks before, we usually like to finish on. So what can we do about it? Or what is, you know, some of the ask? And I think you very clearly uh, given us a specific ask there, haven't you? Of, uh, of There's the also, but there's also um, the prison visitor scheme where someone comes in and go, does a visit in visits. So we can give a name and um, someone will say, you know, if they haven't got anyone visiting them, then, then, then someone will come in and do that in visits and they go on, that's a different scheme to volunteering. Volunteering, you get keys, you know, and you, and you go around the prison and it's fascinating. And as I said, safer than walking through Piccadilly at night. That sounds great, Joe. Um, Keith always sends some information out after any talk that we have. So if you've got any information or any web links on those things that you could, we could send. And the book recommendation, I was going to come back to that as, as well, really. And um, I think you've given us a fabulous insight into not just the day of a chaplain, <laughs> but actually okay, all, of the things you, <laughs> all of the things that, that you do. And most importantly, I think we've all, we can all see your passion and commitment for this. Um, as I probably communicated to you before, I think you are hot you know, that you are doing some of our work and caring for some of our neighbours that it's very difficult for us to care about. And some of those people that are forgotten, probably by most of us a lot of the time. So really appreciate what you've done tonight, but probably most importantly, the role that you carry out, I think, on, on all our behalf. Um, Thank you, I, I think we all have a challenge to think about restorative justice and, and think about what more we can do. And that might also be right into our MP. Tonight may have inspired us to do to do some of that. So thank you very much, Joe, on everybody's behalf. But thank you thank for you. all of you giving your time and coming to listen and learn and hopefully understand something about um, more about how uh, prisons operate and a prison not so far away from us. So thank, thank you very you. much, everybody. And thank you. Good night and God bless. Thank you. Joe. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hi. Thanks very much, Joe. Thank you. Thanks.